When one obtains a p-value from a computer statistics package, one may be working implicitly with assumptions hidden from view that Gaussian distributions are everywhere. The purpose of this video, as well as the next module, is to understand when these assumptions are and are not plausible. In this video, we will try to generate intuition for the central limit theorem. On the left side of the screen, we toss a coin two times and count up the number of heads we obtain, or we toss a coin four times and count the number of heads that result, or we toss a coin eight times, and so forth. On the right side of the screen, we plot the probability distributions for obtaining different total numbers of heads for these different experiments. Specifically, we are tossing a coin two times, four times, eight times, or many times, with the situation of many times illustrated using the faint smooth curve in front. As the number of coin tosses increases, the histograms take on a special limiting distribution called a Gaussian, or so-called normal distribution. In this video, we will walk through the physical picture on the left and outline an optional derivation the viewer may perform to derive the shape of the smooth distribution on the right for the particular situation of coin tosses. The purpose of this discussion is to generate intuition for the central limit theorem, which says that when one is interested in a random variable, itself the sum of a large number of independently fluctuating random variables with no small number of these dominating the fluctuations of the sum, then the random variable of interest fills out a Gaussian or so-called a normal distribution. The Gaussian distribution can be regarded as describing the limit of many independent coin flips. Consider a coin tossed a single toss at a time. For simplicity, use a fair coin so that p equals one half. Half the time one obtains heads and half the time one obtains tails. The average number of heads per toss is one half. Now consider the same coin tossed twice. The probability of landing heads in any single toss is still p equals one half. We now have four outcomes. Sometimes we obtain two heads, sometimes we obtain two tails, and often we obtain one head with one tail. We use the word often because there are two ways to obtain one head and one tail, either with the head turning up on the first of two tosses, or instead with the head turning up on the second of the tosses. The average number of heads per pair of tosses is 1. At the bottom of the screen, consider the same coin now tossed four times in each experiment. The probability of obtaining heads in any single toss is still p equals one half. On average, the total number of heads expected for four tosses is two heads. On occasion, one will obtain four heads in a row or instead four tails in a row. Often, however, one will obtain, for example, two heads and two tails because there are multiple ways to obtain this result. We illustrate two examples with sequences, tails, tails, heads, heads, and heads, tails, heads, tails. Additional possible sequences may be enumerated by the viewer. From the three concrete examples we have illustrated on this slide with n equals one toss, n equals two tosses, and n equals four tosses, abstract to the process of allowing capital N to increase arbitrarily without bound. Do this in a fashion that holds p, the likelihood of obtaining heads on any single toss, constant. For the examples depicted on this slide, p has been fixed at one half. If capital N is allowed to become arbitrarily large and little p is at the same time held constant, then the expected number of total heads for capital N tosses becomes arbitrarily large because it is a product of a number increasing without bound multiplied by a constant. We just outlined one physical context on the left from which a Gaussian distribution can arise. In the next section, we will outline an optional derivation the viewer may perform if he or she wishes to see how the Gaussian distribution illustrated and written at the right arises in this particular process of coin tosses. The algebra in the full calculation is rather involved, so in this section we present only an outline. We are considering a limiting process in the context of a binomial distribution. 
Recall that the probability for obtaining x total heads from capital N tosses is expressed in terms of a combinatoric factor, a factor of p to the x, and another factor of n minus x powers of 1 minus p. The purpose of this calculation is to substitute the conditions on the right into the equation on the left. We want to apply the condition that capital N is allowed to increase without bound, that the expected number of total heads obtained from capital N total tosses also increases without bound, particularly in a fashion with little p held constant, and in this example the probability of obtaining heads on any individual toss is one half. To organize the calculation, we label the combinatoric factor f and the remaining factors g. Use a change of variables that defines the deviation delta x as the difference between a particular value of x and its expectation value. Use the coordinate change to express f in terms of delta x rather than in terms of x. Take the definition of delta x and dump it into the expression for f. The result should be a quotient with n factorial upstairs and n over 2 minus delta x factorial times n over 2 plus delta x factorial downstairs. Apply Stirling's approximation to these factorials. This means we are considering ranges of values of capital N and X in which each of these factorials is large. The viewer may discuss the constraint on the values of delta X that these considerations imply. On the right, we re-express G in terms of the probability little p, taking the value of p equals one half on the right and placing it into g on the left should result in the quantity g equals 1 over 2 to the n. Combine the expressions for f and g to obtain an expression for the probability distribution capital P that includes a leading factor of the square root of 2 over pi n out front, followed by factors of 1 minus or plus 2 times delta x over n, that quantity taken to the minus quantity n plus 1, that quantity over 2, plus or minus delta x power. Define Q as 2 times delta x over capital N. Q can be as negative as minus 1, meaning no heads are obtained from N tosses, and as positive as plus 1, meaning N heads are obtained from N tosses. Place the definition for Q inside the probability distribution capital P to obtain an expression with a lot of square roots and Qs. Use yellow highlighting to label a first factor and orange highlighting to label the remaining portion to the right. To what degree do these factors vary as the variable q changes? When q equals 0, meaning when delta x equals 0, so that x equals its expectation value, capital N over 2, the yellow and orange factors both equal unity. When q moves off the average value of 0, the yellow and orange factors can change. Consider the example where q equals 0 0.5. The yellow factor has increased to 1.15. The contents inside the square root of the orange factor may at first appear to be similar in order of magnitude to unity. Notice, however, that these contents are taken to a power of capital N which we allow to be arbitrarily large. When taken to large powers, numbers near unity can turn into numbers much larger or much smaller than unity, and in this example the orange factor turns into 2 times 10 to the minus 6 when n equals 100. This is orders of magnitude smaller than unity. The same variation in Q that causes a 15% variation in the yellow factor causes orders of magnitude of variation in the orange factor. Thus, as a rough approximation, we regard the orange factor as the source of all the variation in the probability distribution capital P and replace the yellow factor with a constant factor of 1. To prepare for graphical analysis on the next slide, we take the natural logarithm of both sides of this equation. Identify the pink part as h squared on q and then use a computer to plot its positive square root h on q. The resulting curve is very simple. Particularly in the region near q equals 0, we obtain approximately straight lines. We obtain h equals minus q for q less than 0 and h equals positive q for q greater than 0. Because h is roughly equal to plus or minus q, h squared is roughly equal to q squared.
The natural log of capital P can thus be simplified by replacing the factor of 1 minus q natural log 1 minus q plus 1 plus q natural log 1 plus q with simply q squared. Now substitute the definition of q back into the natural log of capital P, and then rearrange factors so as to make the number 4 appear in a couple places. The purpose of this formatting is to parametrize the probability distribution in terms of its variance. We are studying a binomial distribution, so the variance sigma squared is capital N times P times 1 minus P. For the case in which p equals 1 half, the variance sigma squared equals n over 4. Substituting sigma squared for two instances of n over 4, and exponentiating to remove natural logs on both sides, we obtain a more familiar expression. This probability distribution is sometimes written with the sigma in the denominator pulled out forward from the square root, and with delta x written out explicitly as a deviation from the average value mu. p on x equals 1 over sigma square root 2 pi times exponential of negative half times the square of x minus mu over sigma. This is the Gaussian or so-called normal distribution. The presence of a square power inside the exponential along with the negative sign causes the distribution to decay very rapidly as one moves away from the average value. This distribution is sometimes said to be bell-shaped. The region extending from a standard deviation below the average to the average and the region extending from average to a standard deviation above the average each contain 34% of the total area under the curve. These two slats each contain about 14% of the probability. Each of these two slats contain about 2% of the probability, and the remaining regions each contain a tenth of a percent of the probability. The horizontal axis is the deviation of x from its average value, measured in units of sigma, where sigma is the square root of the variance also known as the standard deviation. Roughly two-thirds of the area under the curve is found between minus 1 and 1. It is found, so to speak, within the first standard deviation. In this video, we have walked through the physical picture on the left and outlined a calculation you may perform if you would like to derive the expression for the smooth distribution on the right. The purpose of this discussion was to generate intuition for the central limit theorem, which states that if we are interested in a random variable, itself the sum of a large number of independently fluctuating random variables, with no small number of these dominating the fluctuations of the sum, then the random variable, that's the sum, fills out a Gaussian or so-called normal distribution. In the next video, we will explain how the central limit theorem is sometimes used to argue that Gaussian distributions are prevalent in physics labs and, in a disguised form, in biology.